Welcome to the Cyber Cuba Day. This is Tim Wainwright and Chris Salerno. Our topic today, supplier risk programs, what's working and what's worthless. Hmm. All right, today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Supplier Liar, the only supplier risk scoring platform that uses artificial intelligence to pinpoint the dirty lies submitted by your vendors in your risk questionnaire. That's Supplier Liar. So Chris, um, let's get straight to the point. Are supplier risk programs working? Is what we're doing actually reducing supplier risk? I don't think so. Uh, in their current state, uh, they're questionnaires. And uh, I'm not going to say that they're not factual, uh, but they're definitely not telling the whole truth. There's not, uh, there's, you're never going to get a full whole truth statement out of these questionnaires because you're not talking with anyone. You're, you're getting regurgitated answers. Year over year. I just want to point out, you sound a little bit like a lawyer right now, but you're like, it depends on what the definition of the truth is. The, you can't right. handle the truth. <laughs> not in supplier risk world. I actually think supplier risk programs can't handle the truth. I think that's a little bit what we're talking about. I mean, the problem, I, so we're treating them the wrong way. Um, and we're, we're not treating them like we treated PCI programs, for example, where you go through and actually map out data flows, understand where the sensitive information is going from you to the, the third party supplier and from the third party supplier back to you. What are those connections? Uh, and some of these reports we get like a SOC 2, yeah, it's good to have. Uh, but they certainly lack context. So I think we need to be, be thinking about how we're doing supplier risk a, bit, a little bit differently. All right. So you're saying, you're saying that one of, the thing, one of the things I'm picking out of that is in supplier risk, the assessments that we're doing of our suppliers are perhaps too shallow. And one of the things specifically you see missing is a focus on, on data flow. You know, where, 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 are, uh, you know, where are suppliers actually taking custody of processing, transmitting, um, the data, the data that they're uh, it's exactly they're it. trusted to them. It's exactly it because I think, and I don't have as much uh, experience with these, but we've got these exchanges and scorecards that are popular now. We we've got these different uh, ways of of disseminating the information. Right. I think that's better. Uh, but but what what are they really doing? I guess you know what, what what's your thoughts on those? Are they actually helping solve this problem? <sighs> I don't think so. Not very well. And it's for some of the same reasons you've talked about. And, and, and let's take a step back and say, what's the point of a supplier risk program? And, and let's talk about these exchanges and scorecards, but what's the point of it? The point of it is to understand that if one of our suppliers is compromised, will it affect us in a material way? And I think that's one of the problems that we're seeing with some of this declarative questionnaire based approach is that's never been a great way to answer that question. Yeah. Um, so the way that the exchanges and the scorecards are working right now, uh, and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to contrast those two things. Uh, although I think that their functionality is kind of coming together in some of the platforms that I'm familiar with that are out there right now. The idea of the exchange is uh, an organization either in, in, trying to do it on behalf of an industry or, or independently of industry saying, we are an authoritative repo of security questionnaires and results for common suppliers that a lot of organizations use. And my biggest problem with this, I actually, I like that vision. That makes sense. Let's be efficient because this, why did, why did, why did these exchanges emerge? They emerged because everyone was doing an independent assessment, big yeah. bank, a big bank, B big pharma, a, you know, they're all, they're all assessing the same organization because they provide similar services. And it's just, there was a, just a lot of redundancy duplication of effort. And they said, what, why can't we all just agree to one thing? But the problem with that is with the exchange, you know, you have a bunch of private companies and even industry consortiums throwing their hands up and saying, we are like, we're the authoritative source on this. So there's already more than one. Uh, that's one issue. And then my biggest problem with it is since it's still just questionnaire based, it's declarative. And I, I don't think that these organizations are doing a lot of quality checking on the data that goes in. And I also know that a supplier does not want to have a bad result. They don't want to have a bad score. And I think a lot of the quality checking that's happening on these exchanges is really limited to, are these complete answers? Is there an attachment of evidence where there's supposed to be an attachment of evidence? And I don't think that they're consistently vetted. And if you're asking uh, the supplier to volunteer information and, and ask these questions, 
there's not going to be a lot of suppliers volunteering major gaps. So it, it, to me, it's an issue of garbage in, garbage out. If, if the data going in isn't honest and good, because it's only going to hurt that supplier to have their record living up on an exchange for a lot of people to access, yeah. you're not going to get good results. You're not going to get good risk management out of that. So, so that's the exchanges is the scorecards. Do, do they suffer for the same fate? Like, is it, is it basically the same thing? So th this is where I contrast. I mean, and as I said, I think most of the products kind of bring some of these things together or they have two, you know, two different modules you can buy. A scorecard to me is something that gets automatically generated uh, a record on a supplier without them submitting anything. So what does that mean? That means that the scorecard company has some level of OSINT and scanning capabilities that they do on the internet to try to understand who is this company, where are their locations, do they have vulnerable web, you know, they have websites with vulnerabilities using bad, you know, bad certificates and things like that. And they kind of put together a composite score based on the available information. And I take a big issue with that too, because that's really a very small, uh, that's a really a very small part of a risk posture assessment. Um, I, I remember uh, talking to a rep at one of these uh, one of these scorecard companies over a year ago, and asking, you know, how do you come up with these? How do you come up with these scores? Why is this? Why is this organization a C? Why is this organization a B? Um, and, and 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 you know, the the person and and I won't say who it is and uh, or what company it doesn't matter because I think they, they do this similar similarly kind of said, well, you know, some of it's some of it's based on based on some arbitrary information, for example. One of the things that we used to use, although we adjusted this, was if we could identify that an organization had a guest wireless network, that would automatically cost them points. And, and you and I know that's, that's ridiculous. You could very easily provide a guest network that's either very secured or just open and not connected to anything, just hanging off, hanging off on a cable modem going off on, in the nowhere that doesn't pose a very significant threat. Um, so I, I think that, that basing this information just on externally available OSINT type information is just not a fair way to represent. And I'll tell you another one, another story. Uh, one, one of my friends um, used to be at an organization that had a very, uh, very general, very generic name. So it was like XYZ Co, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of XYZ Co's out there. And they had one of these scorecard organizations essentially holding them hostage because they were the type of organization that was a service provider to a lot of other uh, inst institutions. And they had uh, a blemished score and they contacted the, the scorecard company and said, why is this? Like, we don't understand. What, what are you seeing that we're not seeing? And they pointed to this website that was like, you know, xyzco.com. You know, UK. Whatever. And, and it, it had a name similar to theirs. In fact, the same name. Because like, like I said, XYZ is pretty popular as a name. But it wasn't theirs. And they couldn't get them to change it. They're like, well, and literally it turned into like an extortion yeah. situation where they're like, well, if you buy our service, then we can help you work on your score. AKA so, yeah. turn, turn, turn a lie and turn a lie into a truth. Like what, like, what is that? So I have an issue with not the vision of these companies. I just don't think that there's a good way. And whenever I say something's terrible, I like to have a good, like a better way to act, to execute on it. But I don't think the exchanges and the scorecards are ever going to really be able to execute well because of the scale uh, and the methods that, that, that they're trying to come up with these scores for. Now, it doesn't mean they're not going to be successful. I think people will pay for them. I think there's a lot of compliance programs that want to say, we have 500 organizations and look, we can, we can pull up a score on any of them. That kind of makes you feel good. But I'll come back to the beginning of, of, of the cast here, Chris, and say, I'm not sure that's managing risk very well. Yeah, it sounds like we're taking everything that we knew was wrong about personal credit scores and applying them at the company level. That's just not, right. just not what you want to do. That's just silliness. But people want to do it because we understand that concept. And, and, and personal credit scores is a risk management function for yeah. people to understand if you're credit worthy. And this is just something that it, it's a concept that we would like to translate better yeah. than it does. Yeah. So Chris, you know, are, are there any other things that we think organizations should stop doing, stop doing right away when it comes to supplier risk. Like you're spending too much time on this and you're not getting a lot of value for it. And then let's make sure we save just a little bit of time for, for some good ideas on this topic. But what, anything else that, should, that, that organizations should stop? Uh, I, my, my number one is, is basically the summary of what we've talked about. Stop the 700 question questionnaires. They're wasting everyone's time. Even the ones that are well written and responded to, who's reading them? Who's analyzing yeah. them? Who's is there somebody on the other end that has technical 
skill and understanding and mastery to really follow up and ask the right questions around each one of those, you know, seven, maybe it's not 700, maybe it's a hundred, whatever, still, still too many. Uh, that's what I think. What, what, what's your, what's your take? What do, what do people need to stop doing? My, my number one, and, and hopefully with more and more organizations moving their workloads to the cloud, this, this starts to go away even more, yeah. but my number one is data center tours. Like stop touring data centers. I don't know, man. You're wasting your time. The chances of the chances of you on the day of your appointed data center tour catching a door that's propped open that shouldn't be propped open are so, are just slim to none. I'm not saying it's never happened. I'm sure it's happened, but should you spend thousands of dollars to get on a plane and go take a data center tour of like FM 2000 suppression systems, fire suppression stuff like just no, that's not that takes too long for what you're going to find out. How many so dry, how many dry standpipes have you seen in your day? I, I don't know. It's been so long. I barely remember what that is. I'm sure I had to know for my CISSP exam, uh, which, was quite, which was quite a while, quite a while ago too, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't exactly way. fall into the realm of, of the practical security I like to live in. So okay. sorry, sorry, sorry. You can't quiz me. Uh, maybe multiple choice. I'd, uh, you know, I'd get something right around that these days. I don't even know if I would, I don't even, I would. Um... So, so, so what works well, Chris? Well, or what? Or what? What? What's? Or what's a new idea? What's something that that most organizations aren't doing around su supplier risks that you think could work? You know, as I kind of hinted at, I think supplier risk could take a cue from some of the other assessments we do, even even some of the the framework assessments, and get a, a little bit more technical. Supplier risk traditionally is a less technical thing that we do. It's yeah. It's a bunch of questions and answers. So why not? Go ahead. I was going to say, is that just because we've assigned less technical resources to doing it? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy no, that we, that, that it's been less technical because it's been, okay, go ahead. I, I think the, I think the people that are doing them can be smart enough. And really, if they, if they were only asked to understand 20 to 30 atomic test cases that were technical enough to measure how well that company is doing with just basic defensive security posture, uh, I think they would be able to understand those pretty readily. Basic things like, hey, you know, we might ask the question, do you have, uh, you know, multi-factor uh, on your VPN? Well, why don't we actually just test for it? I mean, it's mm -hmm. a quick test. What, what about, you know, can you detect when someone is conducting a password spray against your most important portal? Just test it. We've got, we've got the ability to test things in a very quick fashion now, and we've got the ability to make those tests repeatable. Right. So I really feel like we, we've got to do that. And, and in some cases, we, did, we were making this technical at some point because the, the, the supplier risk folks were asking for pen test yeah. expectations. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these letters. Of course you have. You've probably written some of these letters. Uh, hey. It's the most generic piece of paper you've ever seen. It you can't say too much. You can't say anything. You can yeah. basically say, you'll be, you'll be hanged with it. We did the test. We found some things and we're working on fixing those things. That's literally every vendor letter I've ever seen. And I don't think that works. I think we need to actually start measuring in a real way uh, to actually reduce some of the supplier risk. I don't think there's been a supplier risk program that looks that can do a look back and say we were successful in any meaningful way of preventing a breach of our networks because of what we did in supplier risk and i want that to change i i i love the vision i agree with you on that and i think i, I like your idea of a smaller set of test cases because if you're going to do you know those uh, repeatable type of you know 20 to 30 atomic test cases as you put it that should be much more time efficient than doing a full pen test, which is going to take even for a normal organization. It, it, it's a week to do an external pen test and it can be much longer for, for much bigger organizations. And, it, and it's, it's, it's not very practical, right. but I, the other thing that, that um, I think we, we need to hone in on here is we've said before with the big questionnaires, don't ask a question that you don't care about the answer to. Yeah. But I would say the other part of that is, if you're gonna ask a question, you're gonna ask more focused questions, like you have to really mean it. And, and if you get an answer back that's wrong, well, what is that gonna mean? So in, in the pen test world, and I remember, I remember this, this was from many years ago, this is one that I remember you did uh, hands-on, and, and we had a, a large organization that asked us to do a pen test of a SaaS platform they were gonna use. And you destroyed the platform like several ways, and like in ways that we didn't expect, like, wow, this is like, 
the vulnerabilities in this thing are, are, yeah. are, from, are from five years even before I then. I think I remember this, yeah. And, and what was wild about it was the organization that engaged us when they saw the results, I remember being on the phone, they went and they, they told the supplier, they said, you're sec- you, we feel that you lied to us about your security posture. I remember. And you overrepresented this. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going off the rails. And, and I started defending <laughs> the SaaS provider. Cause I was like, I was like, well, yeah, these issues matter. Or we wouldn't be talking about it, but, but at a point in time, or, or you know, no one's ever tested this like this before. And these are fully addressable issues and they were, but that large organization persisted it. And they said, well, no, we feel like our trust has been betrayed. You're not the only player out there. We're not working with you. And I believe that is not, you know, no, that is an outlier in no, terms no, of, in terms no. of the reaction. I don't think I've seen that since, but your idea for doing the atomic test cases. So if you say, Hey, we want to know that you can detect credential dumping on your domain controller, that's a little invasive, but super important. Yeah. So what happens if they can't, are you not going to work with them now? Is the recommendation going to be, Hey, we picked out some miter attack aligned test cases that are really important. Like this is like the, this is, this is the essential stuff. And if they don't pass it, which you and I both know most organizations when they really do those technical tests for the first time, they usually don't. And for a lot of these suppliers, this would be their first time running through it. Um, they're going to look bad. So is but, that the criteria that you really, that, that, that deeply technical, but very relevant criteria is something that you think supplier risk programs are ready for, or is this like, Hey Tim, this is what we're going to be doing in four years. I, I, I think they're ready for it. I think they're, I think they're even wired for it because right now when you get a comment back on your questionnaire that you didn't meet one of the things that they wanted to see, you get time to fix it. You get months to fix it in, in some cases. So let's give sure. them time to fix it. And but let's not just say because you're like this right now, we're not going to work with you, but right. let's see some improvement. And you can measure that improvement by repeating those test cases over. And I think I think that's very doable. Right. Um, I had a, uh, I have an idea too about uh, how to do this better. I, I'm not saying that, and I don't want anyone, everyone to get the impression to say that people can't assess supplier risk and taking people out of the equation um, is, uh, is the answer to this. It needs to be all technical. I don't think that's the case. Um, before that, another uh, sponsor message from Supplier Liar, which automatically risk ranks vendors lies to help your team prioritize your heated follow-ups. Um, so, so my idea here is um, we do need to engage in conversations with our most critical suppliers. That's, that's, not, that's not my new idea. I just agree with that. Right. But we need to keep it to the most, the most sensitive vendors, the most sensitive suppliers, and we need to be willing to let that be a smaller population. Yeah. Um, so something I got to do many years ago that I thought was a great approach that I don't think is, is used very often is um, I was asked by a large financial organization to represent them, essentially act like I'm part of their team and go ask their biggest suppliers, which were also many large financial organizations. They all kind of do different services for each other that most people don't understand. And, uh, and they said, we want to know uh, how they're handling our information because this is, these are our crown jewels. This has board level visibility. So do a really good supplier risk assessment of each one. And what I liked about this is I didn't have to use pre-existing materials. I didn't have to use the 700 or even the 350 questionnaire. Uh, and what was funny is when I started talking to these organizations, they had those things ready. Like, here's our, here's our, our packet of stuff that you want to read. And I'm like, no, thanks. Not interested. <laughs> and they're like, well, the data center tour is, is scheduled for an hour from now. I'm like, that's okay. You can tell them to go, go home or, t- or take a lunch break. We're not going to be doing that either. Uh, because what I did here was I created a set of uh, about 20 questions and they were really focused just on the things that mattered to the relationship that I should care about. And I'll call back to what you were saying about data flows. I was talking about, okay, you have this financial institution's data. Tell me where it goes, who has access to it. Show me your data flow diagrams and got real specific on, on the, the custodianship of the data. And I think other supplier risk programs do that too. Here, here's where I got a little bit different. When it came to uh, asking them questions about their enterprise security, I was not asking about asset management because I already know the answer. I already know their answer and I already know it's a lie. Yeah, we have great asset management in CMDB. I'm like, no, you don't, right? I don't even need to know that. Know that know, I'm not going to ask that question because I, I don't care about the answer. What I did care about were specifically how well they're doing at, 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 and trying to be better at prevention, detection, and response. And the interesting angle to this was, again, fewer questions, very focused. I also had permission 
from the CISO of this organization to be a little bit more open book about what, yeah. what the organization I was representing was doing saying, Hey, here's a type of detection technology we're working on right now. Yeah. We're not great at it yet, right. but here's our success. Have you guys tried this? What are you doing? Or do you have a different path? And we made it a consultative supplier risk assessment program. And it was interesting to me to see, uh, you know, they expected a you know, third party auditor to come in and, and, and to be really rigid and ask very specific questions and then hopefully just get through it and, and tr you know, try to try to smoke screen me and hope this thing was over. And I remember one of the, one of the execs that I got to talk to, which is after, after, after like 10 minutes in the conversation, this person just like, who are you? Yeah. Like, you're not a third party auditor normally, are you? And it's like, today I am right. <laughs> but we had a, but we had a great conversation about it, but it, but it took a, it took a very different approach. And it was, if what we sounded like earlier was that you need to take the people out of the equation, it wasn't that it was yeah. have the, have my recommendation for overall for doing better supplier risk management is limit it to fewer suppliers, be very personal in the approach, but also introduce practical technical measures that are really going to help you uh, improve the security of your supplier because you, naturally you want to make sure that they don't have security issues that are going to affect your business. Yep. Any, any party, party thoughts on this, Chris? No, I think that's, you know, that, that, that kind of hits it. I, I would like to just see this be more technical. I think we've got a long way to go with understanding these controls and, uh, and making it a better service, not only for the people reviewing the vendors, but for the vendors themselves don't waste their time either. Yeah. Yeah, all the all the all the SaaS providers are very used to having their time wasted. They, they, <laughs> they would love for <laughs> they would love for that to happen. Uh, well, this has been a, a fun Kumite. I'm Tim Wainwright, reminding you that I taught Chris everything he knows, and I'm Chris Lerno, telling you that most of that knowledge is about SNL skits from the '90s.